Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Paul Soudon. Uh, I'm from the University of Winchester. Um, again, my brief was 10 minutes. Um, and really, I want to talk to you a bit about what we're doing on the next OECD project to look at creativity and critical thinking in higher education. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was just to sort of reflect on the institutional context under which uh, we're doing this work. Uh, because I think that's very important, and actually it's something that OECD are trying to capture in their measures. So what is the climate for creativity and critical thinking like in an institution? Well, at Winchester, the university styles itself as being the University for Sustainability and Social Justice. Now, I think creativity and critical thinking are very close friends of sustainability and social justice. We're going to need creativity to address the problems of sustainability that face us. We're going to need critical thinking as one of our tools to achieve social justice. So they're very important uh, pillars of the university's values uh, and what it's about. Um, the university also, of course, houses the Centre for Real World Learning. We've heard lots from uh, Bill Lucas over the last couple of days and the involvement of, of him and his centre in the OECD project that's uh, the book and uh, so on that's been launched at this meeting. So... I think the climate is good. I'm going to be interested to hear whether my colleagues feel the climate is good when we uh, use the OECD tools. But I think the climate's good. I just wanted to reflect a bit about what we're doing to look at creativity and critical thinking in the university. And I want to do it largely in the words of the staff themselves. So what are they doing? So I'm going to use a lot of sort of material from our initial preliminary work uh, that describes how staff see the interventions that they're conducting to foster creativity and critical thinking. So, we're just getting going. And uh, we've done two things so far. And we're doing this in a, a ground up way. You know, of course, there's a massive evidence base out there that we can draw upon to design activities, and that's something that we'll be looking to do. But also, there's a wealth of experience within the institution. There are many, many things that people are already doing that are, I think are likely to be examples of fantastic practice. Which um, are the most effective is something that's going to be really interesting to find out. So we ran an initial survey, and that survey had three elements. First of all, we just wanted to actually get an understanding of how do people conceptualise creativity and critical thinking. If you, if you have a feel for how people think about these things themselves in their practice, then, of course, you have an idea about what they're going to be aiming for in their teaching. And I think that's a very, very important thing to bear in mind. We've heard about definitions of creativity here. Um, we've heard about the importance of novelty, but also of effectiveness or getting it right. I think you said something to that effect before, Carl. Yeah. Um, but is this how staff see it? Is this what they're aiming for? Is this their belief and understanding? So we asked about the creative process, the end product, and people's experience of being creative and of being critical. Um, we asked about people's current teaching, so what are they actually doing? Um, and we sought to engage them through this process. And then we followed that up with meetings with small groups of staff to discuss methods currently in practice at the university and hear a bit more about what they're doing and what they would like to do. And I've tried to kind of curate some of the, the statements that people have made just as a kind of first brush um, through. This is just some words. We gave people a list of a hundred and something words and allowed them to, to add more as they wish. And this is what people said um, in terms of the experience, the sort of effective experience of creativity and critical thinking. Yeah, there's not much bliss in critical thinking. People found it, you know, described it as an effortful process, something that could be rewarding, that could be satisfying, but not something that was necessarily joyful, unlike creativity. Unhelpful beliefs persist. Um, I think it's always worth noting unhelpful beliefs persist. And actually, this is perhaps part of the problem, is just actually addressing these beliefs. So staff and students do label themselves as not creative. Um, some people distinguish creative and non-creative domains, and that, that persists. And I think that's a real problem. So a colleague talking about research methods just said, I don't focus on this. I associate the word creativity with art and crafts. This is a persistent problem. Um, someone working in accounting and finance noted this is a rule-based subject. You're not allowed to be creative. When we ask people what excites them in their teaching of creativity, 
I just want to sort of pull out the underlining of the things I'd wanted to pull out here. Um, so someone talking about creativity says, well, it shows me that students can think independently, that they're not try merely trying to remember facts. So this is about the value. This is what, why people are engaging in this. And these, of course, are the things that um, will help us engage staff. Yeah? By sharing the things that staff value about creativity and critical thinking in their students. I thought it's interesting. When students trust their process, collaborators, and knowledge, and discover something unintended, but also recognize and value that. Yeah. So it's the recognition and the value that they place upon the endpoint of that creative process. Reflecting uh, the sort of lack of creative self efficacy that many students have. A colleague says students devalue their own creativity as a matter of course. Again, captured in the OECD measures in the next project, is going to be capturing that sense of creative competence. So to what extent do the things that we do help students engage, believe that they're creative? Because we know that's a big predictor of final creative outcomes. We had ideas about safe spaces. We saw that um, in one of the uh, breakout sessions uh, just yesterday a safe place from which to be creative. And of course, students looking forward to an assessment rather than it being a chore. So these are just themes, and they reflect many of the things we've heard over the last two days. With respect to critical thinking, it's the bridge to intellectual independence, one staff member said. It brings about a sense of empowerment. Um, requires motivation and determination. It's not always easy. We've heard a lot about that. Critical reasoning is how we identify the truth. It's about challenging the status quo, promoting social justice, helping students develop their own values. And of course, the end point of critical thinking is the opportunity, the chance to explore further data and research. So these are just the things that the staff are perceiving. So this is reflecting very nicely many of the themes, many of the conversations that we've been having. So now I want to turn to the things that staff at the university are already trying to do to foster creativity and critical thinking. So a colleague working in music, sound and film production is, amongst many other things, trying to provide inspiration. They have a very nice podcast. Um, it's called 10,000 Years. Now, 10,000 Years is a podcast about a team of scientists. This is a real thing. Um, multidisciplinary team of scientists who are assembled to think about what kind of labelling or signage do you need at a nuclear waste um, management plant that's going to be operational for the next 10,000 years. So who do you need on that team? Yeah. Do you need linguists to think about the type of labeling? Do you need material scientists to think about the materials that the labels are going to be made from? So who goes on that team? So this is a sort of a, a way in which students can be both inspired and set up a problem-based learning approach to work on. Another type of intervention seems to be about focusing on injecting novelty. So one colleague uh, gives the example of the joy of an unusual activity takes students out of a possible passivity of the expected and makes the learning experience more memorable. A colleague working in choreography injects novelty by getting their choreography students to work with a dance company that is made up of dancers who have some form of uh, physical disability or who are differently abled. And through that sort of collaborative process, a New dance is learned, it's performed, uh, it's toured around, but the students have a sense about a new range of possibilities of what bodies other than theirs can and can't do. So injecting novelty. Surprisingly, there wasn't that much mention in the comments from colleagues about building metacognition, but I suspect this is very important. So this was the sole comment, but I'll be interested to see the practice. So discuss what is critical thinking. Many people talked about changing the environment. I thought this quote from a colleague um, teaching value studies was particularly nice because they talk about all kinds of different types of environmental change. So provide space, time, encourage students to transfer their ideas across context, encourage contemplation, still, autonomy, some silence, but also encourage engaging of senses, dialogue, and making the iterative process of hand-to-mind cognition. So there's all kinds of environmental influences being built into this particular colleague's uh, pedagogic practice. A colleague working in drama talked about taking students out of the classroom. Many people will do this. 
Another type of intervention was focusing on providing challenge. In the discussions yesterday, uh, in the breakout session, uh, a number of colleagues, when asked to sort of think about a positive educational experience they'd had, actually were more drawn to negative educational experiences they've had and how they responded to those experiences. So how they dealt with adversity. Well, challenges are perhaps a more constructive way that we can build adversity into the classroom without um, doing unpleasant things to people. So people talked about things such as, um, you know, in a module that looks at the dark side of the net, setting them problems such as how they go about planning, committing crimes and being given a challenge to work on a problem like that. Um, challenging students to pair disparate theories to see problems in new light. Um, end of year murder mysteries. Uh, using peer review. Yeah? Harnessing the power of peers to challenge each other's ideas and thinking. These are all things that people would do. Another type of intervention, of course, is the use of assessment. Again, this has been discussed um, over the last couple of days. So, students getting choice. Um, in one module, students have the option to write an introduction to an exhibit catalogue. In a critical reflection and law, ethics and social policy module, students are using blogs. And they're writing about a critical incident in practice, and then they're getting together with actual service users. So they're actually discussing their blog and their perspective with people who are actually using the services um, about which they're writing. Extracurricular is another type of intervention that's being used. A colleague was um, working on a project um, that draws on the notion of the hero's journey. So asking students to undertake their own variation of a hero's journey. Um, someone working on a logic club. So there's the sort of enrichment of the curriculum as well. So that gives you a flavour. There's lots and lots of practice, and I could have listed many, many more examples from the many staff who responded to our survey of things that are already going on. But it also, I think, flags the challenge. So we have this wide diversity of practice. We have the messy context of education happening on a daily basis. We have methods such as randomised controlled trials that in most circumstances are going to be extremely difficult to implement. Not impossible. Um, there are colleagues doing it successfully, but in many circumstances, extremely difficult. So how do we take a step from this massive diversity of practice to understand what works, for whom, when, and how? So we're going to be working with staff at Winchester in multiple ways. Um, one is to develop new content. That will allow us to do quasi-experimental work. We're not going to be able to randomly allocate students in a double-blinded way to um, content, but we might be able to do things such as one year have one form of practice and the next year change the practice yeah, and compare in that way. Um, we're going to have a variety of ways of facilitating sharing and development of practice through staff getting together, through mini-conferences, through shared resources of pedagogic materials. We'll be working with the OECD measures that will allow us to measure a variety of things before and after particular educational interventions. And I think very importantly, and this is the bit that I think we need to pay more attention to, we're going to try and do some pilot work to drill into what actually happens in the classroom as an intervention is unfolding. And I'm just going to suggest one way, it's a way that I've used in my own work, which is using verbal reports as data, but actually codifying, modelling analytically um, thinking processes that those verbal in reports indicate. So here's the context. This is a, a balanced model of the creative process we worked, uh, we published two or three years ago. Um, we built the model up. It's very simple. It's a conceptual model here. We built the model up working with architects, working with uh, medical doctors, working with a variety of other higher education professionals, um, and working with a, a, a wide variety of other um, non-doctor, non-architect, non-higher education professionals. Um, now, we've heard a lot about there sort of being you know, two processes. We've heard a lot about um, generating thoughts and evaluating thoughts. I see creativity and critical thinking as intertwined, um, as the beginning and the end of each other, but also things that can happen together. And that's the point of the balanced model. We don't think this is about shifting between one type of thinking and the other. We think that at times you can load up the weight on the analytic end of the thinking process, the evaluative, the critical thinking. At other times you can load up the weight and shift the balance towards 
doing more sort of generative thinking, forming associations, synthesizing material, but also you can be loading both ends up so the thing stays in balance. And this kind of agrees with the underlying uh, evidence base that's coming out of, for instance, uh, neuroimaging work, um, out of experimental studies, that actually very often these things happening together can be strongly predictive of creative outcomes. We see this in our own work. This is just an example of um, some work, again, published a couple of years ago, working with garden designers, both expert garden designers in practice, garden designers in training, fine artists, again, practicing a fine artist, um, and also a, a control sample of people who were not accomplished in terms of their creative outputs in any of these domains. And what you're seeing here um, is a little bit of a timeline as people worked on a garden design. So we get, gave them a garden design brief, we went out to their studios, um, or they came into the lab. We gave them a brief, a set of constraints, and they worked on the design, and we recorded everything they did as they worked on this design process. And then we, we turned everything they did into a verbal report, and we coded it for the occurrence of different types of thinking process. And some very interesting things emerged. We had the designs judged by expert garden design judges. In the UK, we have something called the Chelsea Flower Show. It's fairly world-renowned. We had judges um, from the Chelsea Flower Show look at the outputs of these garden designs. We found some very interesting things. We found, first of all, that when people uh, made statements that showed they'd had an idea and at the same time knew what they thought about it, so there was almost a gut feel, there was a sort of a meshing of the associative and the evaluative component, that was highly predictive of the final design quality. And in particular, we also found that when people had a gut affective reaction, so affect, I think, is very important here, that was particularly predictive of the quality of the final creative outcome. Now, this is just one example of an approach of using verbal reports to get at the underlying thinking process. And I'm looking in this OECD project to scale this up to look at small groups, to find ways of looking at the thinking process articulated by students working in small groups as different interventions happen, to try and understand how different bits of that intervention influence different aspects of their thinking process. Because we need to be able to cut through this diversity of assessments to know which bit of what assessment is influencing the underlying thinking process. And there's just not much work happening in that space. I'd be very interested to hear other people's thoughts on that suggestions for how we might go about that, because this is just one approach. But I think the challenge is, in a sense, how do we skip from this? So this is a, a part of a picture at the uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, to this, and back. Yeah? How do we get from the individual elements of an intervention, the different details, yeah, to the overall effect? Yeah? And to what extent are those individual elements crucial in that overall effect that we achieve, the final creative product? Thank you. <laughs>